This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 160, 936 Miles for Mercy. Since I started making this podcast, I've told the stories of a number of children that have involved the failures of the family court system. So many names pop into my head when I think about it. Thomas Valva, Nakota Kelly, Avery Lee Hobbs, James Beale, Corey Michelow. Since 2008, over 900 American children have died at the hands of a parent or guardian after involvement with the family court system, which punishes parents, especially mothers, for reporting domestic or child abuse. Ohio mom Sarah Moore, who lost custody of both of her boys for that exact reason, has had enough. Earlier this year, Sarah pledged to walk a total of 936 miles from Columbus to the White House and back, one mile for each of the children who lost their lives due to mistakes made by the family court system. This is the story of an embattled mother who will never stop fighting for her children and the quest she's undertaken to draw attention to the epidemic of family court-related child deaths in this country. This is the inspiring story of 936 Miles for Mercy. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my newest patrons, Jarna J from Yardvinpa in the Usima province of Finland and Carol G from Beaverton, Oregon. Thank you so much for your support. Without you, I wouldn't be able to keep this podcast going, so I truly appreciate you. To make a pledge, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod or to make a one-time contribution, you can visit ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. Every little bit helps. Thank you so much. One more thing I'd like to mention is an initiative created by my friend Eric Carter Londeen, the host of True Consequences podcast and the big brother of baby Jacob Londeen, whose story I told back in episodes 35 and 36. I know my listeners feel a lot like I do about these things. If you're passionate about justice and believe that every voice deserves to be heard, you need to know about Angels' Voices Silenced No More. Eric's incredible organization, which is dedicated to empowering victims' families and advocating for justice. Eric is a passionate advocate committed through Angels' Voices Silence No More to making a real difference in the lives of those affected by crime, like his was by the murder of his brother. The organization's unwavering commitment to empowering victims and fighting for justice is incredibly inspiring. Their comprehensive support services provide essential resources, referrals, and assistance to those who need it most. But they can't do it alone. Angels Voices Silence No More needs your support to continue their mission of amplifying the voices of victims and their families, which is a cause I know we can all get behind. Visit angelsvoicesnm.org today, which I'll link in the show notes, to learn more about their initiatives and to make a donation that will make an immediate impact by directly helping families in New Mexico who are fighting for justice. Let's join Angels' Voices Silence No More in ensuring justice prevails, empowering victims, and making sure that no voice goes unheard. Now, regarding this week's episode, when Sarah Moore reached out to me last week, I didn't hesitate in setting up a remote conversation with her. Like I said, I've covered many stories in which a desperate parent pleaded with the family court system to save their children from an abusive parent, only for the child to end up dead at the hands of that abusive parent. There are a lot of deep, systemic issues that need to be addressed nationwide, and that's what Sarah and I spent time talking about, as well as her quest to raise awareness of this issue and her plans for her 936 Miles of Mercy initiative. 
I was surprised to learn that Sarah's younger son, Avit, is famous for his mind-blowing musical talents. You may actually have seen him on one of many TV programs or as a viral sensation online. Avit, who is blind in his left eye, has limited vision in his right, and is on the autism spectrum, began teaching himself to play the piano when he first learned to pull himself to his feet at less than a year old. At 11 months, he was already playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on the keyboard. Listen to what he could play by the time he was three. By six, he was playing a ton of cover songs. At age seven, he performed Bohemian Rhapsody on American Idol. Just listen. Did you have fun doing that? Yeah. Yeah? How is it that you can play the piano so well being so young? Yeah, well, I am a viral sensation. And when I was 11, and I, when I was 11 months old, and when I was about two years old, I knew, I taught myself how to play the piano. And it was just, I don't know. It's just, I don't. You're great at it. I know. <laughs> Thank you for being here, buddy. I love your jacket. Hey. This, this jacket is great, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a Freddie Mercury jacket. Of course it is. He also appeared on Little Big Shots with Melissa McCarthy, where he played Elton John's Rocket Man. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time Touchdown brings me right again to fight. I'm not the man that think I am at all. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. Rocket man. Burning out his is all there alone. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. David has been interviewed by a bunch of local and national news outlets and other programs, and he's been involved with fundraisers and performed live shows. He is an astoundingly talented child. In March of this year, Avit, who is now 10, released his self-titled debut album, which you can hear on Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube. I'll include those links in the show notes as well. I couldn't stop listening to his music once I found it. However, if it wasn't for a dark turn in Avit's story... I wouldn't be telling it right now. Don't worry, he and his 16-year-old brother are alive and seemingly well for the time being. Whether they're safe or not is another story. Sarah lost custody of both of her boys thanks to the family court system, which has been statistically shown to punish parents, especially mothers, who report abuse on the part of the other parent, whether domestic, child, or sexual abuse. 
There are studies that prove this, which I'll also link in the show notes. The following is from a video Sarah recorded when police were sent to her home to collect Avit from his mother by force. What do you think about going to stay with your dad for a minute? I can't go to stay with my dad. It's oh. not safe. It's very, very unsafe. Okay. He's going to question me for four to five hours. It's just not safe. I just, I can't go with him. Okay. What is he going to question you about? He's going to question me about why I don't want to live with him. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds pretty tough, bud. Don't take me. Okay, I promise you I won't touch you. Uh, I can't, I can't open this. I'm not going to open this door. Okay, well, I'm not going to, I won't even touch the door from out here, okay? I know I'm not opening the door. Okay, I won't touch the door. So, when do you think you want to see your dad again? If you don't want to go with him tonight. Okay. Okay, so you never want to see him or talk to him again? Because it's unsafe. I can't. I don't want to see him or talk to him again. It's not safe. Okay. The fear in Avid's voice is heartbreaking, and it reminds me of so many other clips we've heard right here on this podcast of children begging not to be sent with their abusive parents, and we know what happened to those kids. Sarah is fighting with every ounce of strength she possesses to prevent that from happening to her own children and to other at-risk children as well. Let's get into it. My name is Sarah, and um, I'm the mother of Avit Ray. He's a child musician. He was on American Idol, Little Big Shots, The Today Show, and um, I also have a 16-year-old. He's a little bit more private and not so public online. We have been struggling through the family court system for, I guess I've been in this system about 14 years now. And I've fought a total of uh, 10 custody battles between both of my children. And I've learned a lot about the system and how uh, it's pretty much impossible to escape if you have children with your abuser because of the family court systems um, processes and practices. I, I lost both of my children in the last two years. Um, I lost custody of them to their fathers who had been domestically violent towards me in the past um, on multiple occasions, including hospitalizations, head injuries, neck injuries, um, strangulation. And so we're talking pretty severe abuse. Um, strangulation is, you know, attempted murder in many instances. And so these parents were able to continue to take me through the family court system. And eventually over time, because of the processes, they're able to craft stories and narratives to take custody of their children away from you. As I got involved in this and realized how bad it was, I uh, started doing a lot of research and I came across an organization called the Center for Judicial Excellence. And they have this list of child murders from all 50 states. And I saw that there were 936 children that were murdered since 2008 when divorce, separation, custody, visitation, or child support was mentioned in news coverage. That's somehow not surprising, unfortunately. When I started this walk in July, I started it on July 11th, and I had started the campaign named 936 Miles for Mercy And that number, I believe, is over 950 now. And recently, the Center for Judicial Excellence worked with uh, USA Today, I think. A USA Today article came out, and um, the report is that every six days a child is murdered from the family court crisis in America. Uh, So it's a horrific national crisis, and people don't know that it's happening. A lot of parents that go through it are silenced. They're gag-ordered to not talk about their case online. And, you know, I can't share any specifics about my custody case either at the advice of my attorney for fear of judicial retaliation and things that happen behind closed doors. Again, the processes of the family court system keep victims of abuse silenced and in abusive environments. So 
It's my goal to be an activist to uh, reform the family court system so that we can actually keep our children alive and protect our kids. We're punished for protecting our children in family court. And that is very concerning for a lot of reasons. I had not seen the Meyer report that came out a few years ago, and I just saw it. And just the fact that so many parents who report abuse get custody taken away from them is shocking. It is awful that you cannot say anything because the other parent, who is often a narcissist or has traits like that, is able to spin the narrative in their direction and make themselves out to be the victim and and make it look like you're crazy or you're lying. Yeah, exactly. I've had many conversations with expert Barry Goldstein. He's a domestic violence expert. He's a previous past lawyer for, I believe, 25 some years. And he's written a lot of books about the family court crisis. But yeah, he he has really opened my eyes to understanding how this all kind of came to be. But apparently there was a point in time where fathers felt like they didn't have rights. And so Fathers' Rights created an organization and it really swung the pendulum the other way. But what ended up happening was domestic violence is primarily a crime against women, it is um, you know, statistically primarily a crime against women. Not that it doesn't happen to men, but essentially when we're trying to escape because of the work that the father's rights movement did to create this equality or, you know, shared 50-50 bills, it's actually prohibiting victims from being able to escape. So you'll meet a lot of parents who have gone through this and they're really angry and they're like, this is patriarchal and very loud about this being a male dominated issue. And rightfully so, probably. I mean, I'm not expert enough to know or be able to speak on that, but it's so much more than that. People just want to point fingers because they can't wrap their mind around the injustice. Yeah, it's patriarchal. Yeah, it's a judicial problem. Um, judges have judicial immunity. So if they make orders for children to go to their abusive parent and that abusive parent murders them, you can't sue that judge. Um, they have judicial immunity. And there's just literally no accountability for these judges ordering children into domestic violence. Yeah. And the GALs. and Yeah. And I understand that there needs to be able to be something like that. But when we're actively dismissing domestic violence or saying it's irrelevant and then the child's dying from it, like that's on another level, you know? So that's one of the things we're asking for in our quest for change is for the courts to end judicial immunity in family court. Maybe you can have judicial immunity in criminal court, right? But family court and judicial immunity. There should be some accountability at some level. Yeah. No, and then they have terms like quasi-judicial immunity that they give to guardians so that if the child reports abuse to them and they get murdered, they still don't have consequences. Um, 136 of the 936 child murders on that list, 136 of them are directly related to family court orders failing to protect children. And I think, too, one of the huge crises that's occurring is um, there's an increase in children on the spectrum, autism spectrum disorder. My child has autism and his concerns were interpreted as alienation in my case, where when I would explain things to my older son who doesn't have autism, he would be able to understand it and apply it in different areas of his life, things like that. But my child with autism isn't able to understand and interpret in that particular way. And so instead of having an advocate, he was denied a guardian ad litem. He was um, interviewed in chambers without an advocate. And so the crisis is so big because they're not following your constitutional rights. They're not following your ADA rights. And these judges really think they're just really proud of what they think they know. And after so much time of making these rulings, you know, I, I think something happens to a judge where they believe that they're really powerful. And there's a, a missing humility in the system, you know, a humility to just be like, let me look, let me understand, let me see what's unique to this child, things like that, you know? Right. To take everything into account while they're trying to consider this rather than just having a boilerplate yeah. in their head. I'll pause here for a word from my sponsors. I 
how old is Abbott? Is he 10? He's 11 now. He turned 11 in March. Okay. Okay. He is very talented, it sounds like. Yeah. He has so many talents. His talents are exploited through the court system. So what what happens is a, an abuser in family court is rewarded for counterparenting. Say, for example, you escaped domestic violence and you have primary custody of your child because there was a restraining order and the courts recognize it. So they give him standard order of parenting. That's very typical. You escape domestic violence, your children have to go visit unsupervised with the person you just escaped from. That's typical. Number one, that's a huge problem because what we know about domestic violence is that abusers will hurt other people, things, and utilize every resource to continue hurting you, like animals. You've talked about animal abuse, I believe, on your past work. And animal abuse is considered a warning sign to domestic violence. If you kick a a cat, you don't really have a line for what you will or won't do physically to hurt someone, right? And you'll hurt the animal so that you can hurt your victim. That emotionally hurts your victim. And so that's another thing that we're asking for the government to declare, that abuse to a parent is abuse to a child. Um, But what they'll say is, oh, he never abused the child. He just abused you. So he's safe to go to his dad. And then what happens is that dad will counterparent. Oh, you have a medical appointment on my parenting time? No way. You didn't ask me if you could sign up for sports on my parenting time? No way. File contempt, file contempt. So then suddenly the court thinks that you are the cause of conflict because you're doing something on that other parent's parenting time. True loving parents don't counterparent. <laughs> Counterparenting is a very huge warning sign of domestic violence. They just want to argue against everything you're doing on principle, which only ends up hurting the child. And yet the court sees it as you being the antagonist. Exactly. And that's how they're able to change the narrative over time. They make victims of domestic violence appear like the problem. And I don't know if you heard of Ah Moses Gandhi, 16-year-old from Utah. Did you hear about this case? I don't think so. Mom fought for 14 years through the family court system. The judge called her the source of conflict, the problem. And six months after awarding the dad custody, Ahm was murdered by the dad. And that just happened the day before Mother's Day this year. And again, if an abuser has your children, they will hurt your children to hurt you. That is not rocket science. And so that's the other part that I'm asking the government to help with is to add coercive control to the definition of domestic violence. So coercive control, it's those things like counterparenting, using the child as a weapon, as a spy, as a you know, reporting. It's no secret. It's online. The one thing um, about my case is my son, Avid, uh, His there's a, two videos out there. He's reporting that his dad's questioning him for hours, four to five hours at a time and into the middle of the night. Um, and when asked, what do you get questioned about? He gets questioned about why he doesn't want to live at his dad's house. And he gets questioned about what happens at my house. This is coercive control. So now my son, whenever he's at his dad's, he doesn't want to speak to me on the phone because then he'll be interrogated for hours. This is coercive control. And it is a form of domestic violence. Of of both your son and you. Yeah, exactly. So many states do not recognize it. and, And I just wish more people knew what it was and understood how it changes the structure of your brain and the way you think and the way you react to things. Yeah. One of the patterns I found while telling these stories, so what I'm doing is I'm hiking 936 miles from Columbus to the White House and back to Columbus, Ohio. Wow. And I'm hiking the 936 miles and telling the story of every child that's been murdered. One of the things that I've noticed is a pattern that these murderers did not abuse the children prior to murdering them, but they had a history of violence towards the adult parent. So- A lot of times, once they can no longer hurt, physically assault, control, like once they realize that you've psychologically detached from them, don't care about them anymore, then they think, well, if you're not going to continue to give me what I want, attention, control, domination, then I'm just going to kill everyone. And that's the other pattern I've noticed is it's not just that they kill the kids, But they kill the the kids and then they take their own lives and often the lives of the people they're living with or even the person that escaped their domestic violence. 
So many of these cases, like I said, they didn't physically abuse the children before they murdered them. And then it's familiacide. That's another pattern I'm finding. So the systems, the family court systems are resulting in the actual annihilation of the family. Yeah, entire families. It's such a huge loss. Yes. I just told a story last week about a man whose wife could not financially uh, afford an attorney and afford travel for visitation. And they, the court was trying to make her responsible for doing the transportation. And she had escaped domestic violence. They said because she couldn't pay that the dad should have custody. It literally came down to that. Dad got custody. As she continued to fight to protect her kids, the court took more and more of her rights away. And then she finally just stopped contacting them. Four years later, this father was living with his mom and dad, the child's grandparents, and he killed the grandparents, the child, and himself after four years of not having contact with that ex. So I tell people, don't give up the fight. Even if you only have 1% in you, continue trying. Because that little bit of trying, I believe, gives our abusers enough attention and feeling of control and domination that it actually is keeping the children alive. As long as they feel like they can still pull strings, they're going to likely keep you alive. But when they start to feel like they're going to lose complete control, and that's why like Alma was 16 years old. These children are at risk in early ages, but also as they start to grow up and get their independence, one of the main things about coercive control, right, is that they want their victims to be dependent on them. But what happens when you start to go into adulthood? You gain your independence and these abusers don't like it. They have less to control, right? So they're, again, at risk of being murdered as they grow into their older ages. I, I wanted to say, you mentioned earlier about the Meyer study. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it, but the Meyer 2020 study says that women who are abused are more likely to lose custody of their children. And I don't know if you know this, 75% of child sexual abuse reports, in 75% of those cases, they give custody to the alleged perpetrator. 75%. Now, if you allege physical abuse, you lose custody 50% of the time. But sexual abuse, child sexual abuse... If you report that, they will give custody to that accused perpetrator. It's unbelievable. There's no way to protect your child in a case like that. There's no way. I'm sure there's some awful person out there who's falsely making accusations. Okay, but that cannot be the majority of the cases. Yeah. I mean, we have to believe these people far more often than we do. I mean, 936 children. Nine, like we're pushing a thousand and this is just what we know about. Any other situation that was resulting in numbers like that, we'd be doing something about it by now. For sure, right? I mean, domestic violence is the number two killer of police. Mm -hmm. In 2018, the United Nations report stated that 87,000 women were murdered and over half of them were killed by intimate partners or family members. I believe in this country, you're more likely to be killed by an intimate partner than anyone else. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, domestic violence and child abuse being reported in family court, that alone should be, if, if domestic violence or child abuse is brought up in family court, that judge immediately upon hearing those words should be required to say, we're ending this. This is a case for the criminal court. Goodbye. Get out of my courtroom. Because domestic violence and child abuse are criminal complaints. They're, those are criminal charges. They need to go defend themselves in criminal court against child abuse and domestic violence, not just be, oh, well, how much parenting time are we going to give the abuser or the person that reported the abuse? Yeah, you got to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's other problems in the court system, too. Um, a lot of them don't allow cameras or media. So, again, a problem with that accountability. Uh, if you don't agree with the judge's ruling of them giving parenting time, like, say, in those 75 percent of child sexual abuse cases. Research shows that only 2% of reports of child sexual abuse are made up. Wow. But 75% of the time, they're giving custody to that abuser. So there's an organization, and this is really important. It's called the AFCC, the American Family Conciliation Courts or something like that. They train our family court judges to believe that parental alienation 
is like the highest level of crime in family court, that parents cannot be alienated. And this is important. We agree. We don't want to be alienated from our children. No parent does, right? We all agree. Every, it f- feels like this really believable concept be- because alienation is truly happening, right? Like I'm alienated from my child right now. But the fact that we use this word alienation creates a problem because if you go to family, if I went to family court and said, I'm being alienated from my child because I'm a woman, the defense is shown again in the Meyer study. It is shown that I would not be successful because I'm a mother reporting parental alienation. But a father reporting parental alienation receives custody in seven out of 10 trials. Interesting. But the the reverse does not happen for a mother. So the Saunders, I don't know if you've heard of the Saunders study, S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S, but the Saunders study talks about the sex bias that's occurring and putting domestic violence victims and their children at risk. And really this year, sorry, I have like a lot of information, but in 2023, I think it was in May, the United Nations had a special rapporteur submit a report about parental alienation. If you look it up on the United Nations website, you would look up custody violence against women and violence against children. And basically this rapporteur found that the states should prohibit the use of parental alienation in family law cases. And that the states should comply with their responsibilities under international human rights by establishing regular monitoring mechanisms to oversee the effectiveness of family justice systems for victims of domestic abuse. So they're acknowledging that parental alienation is a defense that abusers are using to take custody of children. Because think about it, where a child resists going to an abusive parent for visitation, That abusive parent goes to the family court and says, that mom's in contempt. She's withholding my son. She's not giving me my parenting time. Then the court says, did he get his parenting time? No. Well, you're in contempt. Ultimately, the goal for 936 Miles for Mercy, my campaign, is for us to protect kids from family court. And what I realized after going 15 years through the system is if I wanted to save my children, then I had to save all the children. So save all, save yours. If you want to save your child, if you're listening to this podcast and you know that this is speaking to you or someone that you know, if you want to save a child that's yours or someone that's important to you, if you want to keep them alive, keep them protected from domestic violence, it is not by knocking on the brick wall of the family court system, but it is being an activist and advocating for this reform. There is nothing more important Save all the children to save yours. Save all. Save yours. That's really the message. That's that's what I realized. Even if I was able to overturn and receive custody of my children back, even if I got them home, they're still going to be court-ordered to have contact with those abusers that are coercively controlling, psychologically abusing, and emotionally. They're still subjected to abuse. They're not free. This isn't a matter of getting custody. This is a matter of getting free from domestic violence. Something has to be done. And and I also wish that there was a way to implement more education as early as middle school, definitely by high school, about domestic abuse, what it looks like, how to avoid it. It's such an important topic that, you know, I mean, if I had been more educated, maybe I could have avoided my own situation. That sort of thing It has just always been in my mind. I wish I knew then what I know now. And I wish we could let younger kids know about this stuff so they can avoid it. There there are quite a few organizations, too, that do go to high schools and things like that to train on red flags and warning signs. But if you think about it, the way our systems dismiss our children, like my children do not want to report abuse because they won't be believed. Do you know what happens to them psychologically when that happens? They must lose trust in absolutely everyone. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what kind of training they go through. It's going to be in the back of their mind like, well, this probably ain't even real. This probably won't even really work. Look, until we start believing victims and actually supporting them and giving them what they need, it's almost like it doesn't matter what kind of training or information we give them. I have all the training and information in the world, and I still feel like I get trapped in abusive relationships and toxic relationships. 
I know all the red flags and I still get trapped in those kind of relationships. I still attract those kind of people to me. I still, but I would consider myself really almost, you know, not an expert, but just a step below that on coercive control and domestic violence. I know I'm really, really educated in it. I know most of the things that I need to know, but I still get trapped in those kinds of relationships. I know they say that once you've been traumatized, you're more likely to be re-traumatized. Exactly. That is the exact reason that I don't date. (laughs) Yeah, I was just going to say it's research. It's backed by research. And it's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences, ACE. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, right? The government. So the CDC has a study called the ACE study, A-C-E, and it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. It's literally a 10-question questionnaire about abuse that you've experienced as a child. Um, And the questions are very um, simple. There's a a male version and a a female version, but it's like... um, did you ever witness domestic violence? Did you ever witness somebody cursing at you? Like things like this. And the score out of 10 tells you if you are likely to suffer physical ailments, have your life shortened, be subjected to heart disease and other things because of these 10 questions. That is very interesting. So we know that dismissing a child's report of abuse is harming them right now into their adulthood where they will have their lives cut short because they'll be subjected to different diseases and they'll struggle with different anxieties and depressions, be subjected to having to take medications, all stemming back to what these systems are continuously and knowingly doing to our children. Now for another quick sponsor break. I think the most important thing is we need to adopt the understanding in this country that abuse to a parent is abuse to a child Mm -hmm. and coercive control needs to be added to the definition of domestic violence. Yes. Across the country. Those are the two primary things. One of the experts that I really look up to, I, I think I mentioned him already. His name is Barry Goldstein. He talks about a multidisciplinary approach that is needed to handle family violence in family court. And I, I agree with that. Um, it doesn't need to be some judge sitting on a bench, suppressing evidence, dismissing evidence, you know, like it needs to actually be, these are the real issues. Judges shouldn't just be allowed to issue orders that don't work for your family that continue to subject your children to trauma. That shouldn't be acceptable. They should be held accountable for that. Yes. They're just lining their pockets with my money to continue fighting in that courtroom because they continuously make money off of me when they make orders that don't work for my child. Yeah, they know you'll be back. Yeah. Oh, well, let's make this difficult. So she'll have to be back. We're clients for life, right? If we enter the system as domestic violence victims at a young age, they know that they can keep us at least until 18 years old. We're income to their system for 18 years. And they'll chalk it up to, oh, this is high conflict. The parents don't get along. No, this is domestic violence. This is coercive control. Stop enabling abuse. And if you want to make orders like that, then sign away your judicial immunity. Yeah, you're so confident. Yeah, exactly. So can you can you explain exactly what you're doing with the walk? So you said you started it on July 11th. Is that you started the walk itself and you're doing it in increments or how is this going to occur? Yeah, originally it's kind of evolved over time. But originally I was just going to walk to the White House and back. And as I started walking, people wanted to be involved. Organizations reached out and think they're like, well, let's actually schedule the protest date for the time when people can join you in Washington, D.C. So we're going to be in Washington, D.C. protesting October 21st through the 25th. The final few days, I'll be meeting with uh, Congress and legislators to bring about some law reform. Anybody that comes on the 21st is going to walk the final miles into D.C. with me. So it did originally start as a walk like straight there and straight back. But since we pushed out the protest date to October, which now is only about 30 days away, since we pushed that protest date out, 
I have taken breaks from the trail, come home, spent time with my cats and, you know, worked with my attorney in my own case, um, things like that. It, it was nice to be able to take some breaks. I've been on a pretty long break the last couple of weeks, um, just trying to be able to see my son. I haven't been able to see him despite a court order. Uh, Dad has kept him from me. And so it, it was really triggering. and My PTSD was really bad. So th- thankfully, I think it, it's been really nice to have some of the breaks. But yeah, I bet. Yeah. But now um, this week, I'll be hitting the trail again starting the walk back into DC and then I'll be walking back to Columbus where we're going to do a big protest in Ohio. So, okay. Yeah. The protest in Washington, DC on Saturday, we're going to walk the final mile in and we're going to do a um, sort of like a rally uh, with our signs. We're all, if you can come wear a set of wings, it's Halloween season. So the Halloween stores are open, go buy a set of white wings And the goal is to have 936 people representing the 936 murdered children to give a a visual of how many children that is. Um, So we want 936 people to attend with wings. There's an event on Facebook. I'll I'll send you that link. Um, But if you look up Protect Kids from Family Court event, you'll find it. I will definitely include that link in the show notes so people can get to it. And anybody in the area should aim to join if this matters at all to anybody. Yeah, definitely. Be there. It's so important for people to be there because the congressmen and legislators, like visually, they think the problem is bigger the more people that are there. And so I'm really trying to bring awareness to the country, which is why I'm walking. People don't know that this is actually happening. Like, did you know about this problem before I told you about it today? I knew some of it only because I've been in contact with Kara about James's story and and other. But most people who haven't heard, you know, my certain episodes or the show have no idea no idea whatsoever. Right. And that's basically the whole point of my platform is bringing awareness to these important issues. Good. Yes. Awareness, awareness, awareness. And so, you know, my request is if you can share this podcast, share this episode with the world, there is so much good information shared here today. And um, there's nothing more important than protecting our children from violence and keeping them alive. Like they should not have to be subjected to this level of terror. And one of the things I think about, I was recently walking with a mother uh, whose children were murdered last year, and they were shot in the face by their father after going through family court. And I walked a mile with her for both of her kids. So we walked two miles and she was telling me about her kids. And all I could think about was, what were, what were they doing to try to save each other? In that, those final moments, you know? I told an Australian story that was very similar. And, you know, they huddled together under the desk. The big brother curled himself around his sister to try to protect her. It's heartbreaking to think that those kids had to know that kind of terror in their last moments. It Yeah, it shouldn't be. No, it should not be. Yeah, I mean, no. Like, if you have to escape domestic violence, why would we send children back to that person you had to escape from? That's why... Domestic violence deaths are on the rise, not just to children, but to women, Mm -hmm. because they can't leave. They know they're going to be court ordered to send that child back into that environment unprotected. And their only mistake was having a child with that person that they had no idea this would be the outcome. Yes. No. And as a matter of fact, Emma Katz, she's she wrote the book on course of on course of control recently. Okay. But she was, she just published an article about why coercive control increases after you become pregnant or breastfeed. And it's so revealing that you don't even, coercive controllers don't show their controlling nature until you become a mother often. So it's not even that you would know as a single person. It's, it's, it's a a being that, that like comes out of these people once you become pregnant. Because they know they have you trapped. Yeah. And in her article, she was sharing that they're holding on to attention. Now your attention's diverted. You're thinking about having a baby. You're spending time breastfeeding and you're not giving him attention, right? Your body belongs to the baby now and not to him. Yep. Not to him. Exactly. And so that's where the jealousy and control and domination begin to erupt is during those moments. And so you don't really know that until you become pregnant. So 
again, those red flags that we talked about, you know, that we wish middle schoolers and high schoolers could know, maybe what we need to teach is how to not become an abuser. Absolutely. You know, what's normal when, like, teach your children young that a woman's body becomes a tool for a a child. It is not a tool for a man, you know, like it is. Oh, yes, definitely. You know what I'm saying? Yes, we have to educate kids on both sides of this. Absolutely. I wanted to say one other thing about the protest, and I hope maybe you can be there. I think it would be really cool to meet you in person. But I will definitely try. Yeah, I was thinking about that just when I wrote the dates down. I would like to specifically invite you to come on Sunday if you can't come for the whole time, because on Sunday we're doing a prayer vigil um, on the Lincoln Memorial stairs around 4 p.m., And we're going to read the 936 names of every child murdered. We're going to light a candle in their honor. And we're going to have, yeah, some moms speak about their experience as well. So it's going to be a very somber night, but I think the impact is going to be very emotional. Yeah, for sure. Are you planning to go live with any of those, any of the events that you're doing in any any way, Instagram, Facebook, or whatever it is? I'm sure plenty of people will be going live. I don't know specifically if I am. I, I haven't planned to. I know people are asking me to. The reality is, is I want to be very present so maybe if somebody can manage that for me, you know, that that'll work. But I'm hiking and I'm spreading awareness and all the other things like what's happening in D.C., how organized it's going to be. I'm really just relying on the community of people who care to come together and see that that happens. So that event, I did set it up. But mostly if people are going to attend, it's because people like you share it, invite your friends to it, have your friends invite friends. I have like a limited amount of energy. Yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> you can only do so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. We'll definitely share it. And, and, you know, I, again, will encourage as many people as can possibly be there to be there. You know, it's a lengthy drive for me, but I am willing to do that. You know, if it's possible for me to get away at that time of year, I will most definitely try to be there. It's a very important topic and it's a very important cause to bring to the public's attention because like we were talking about earlier, they just don't know. They don't. And I really feel there's nothing more important than how these systems are feeling our children. The increase in violence that's happening with our families where we can't escape domestic violence or you'll, your children will be ordered into unprotected environments. There's nothing more important You don't want your children's children to have to go through this. If your daughter's trying to escape domestic violence, then they need to be able to escape with their children. There needs to be processes in place. And if that abuser wants to retain contact, then it has to be in a way that's backed by research that's not going to harm that victim or that child, you know? And so there are ways, but right now the pendulum has swung so far. This 50-50 rights, bills, you know, the 50-50 presumption is huge right now, and it's not acceptable. It just puts more and more victims in danger. You mentioned a protest in Ohio as well. When and where is that going to take place? Um, I haven't fully prepared it yet, but it will happen in November. Um, November is Family Court Awareness Month. So we will, I'll end up there, and I'm thinking it'll be about uh, probably um, the week before Thanksgiving. And ideally... It would be to have a table set up with empty chairs showing the number of children in Ohio that have been murdered. And I, you know, highly recommend everyone across America in every state to show up at their capital with empty chairs. You know, um, if you go to my Instagram page and click the link in my bio, it has the state list of child murders. So my Instagram is Sarah D. Moore. S-A-R-A, and there's a link tree. And in that link tree, it has the list of the child murders, you know, so it'll tell you how many per state have been murdered. You know, print out those chairs and put the story in each one of those chairs and then stand out there and protest. These are families that are going to be eating at tables without their children. Every year from now on. Yeah. These are fully preventable murders. These were not things that like, there was an accident and they flipped over the four-wheeler. This is, I reported abuse and my child got murdered. It's preventable. Yes, very, very preventable. That's a great idea. When you get a date set for that, let me know and, you know, I'll share out whatever event that is. Sounds great. That is important. But, you know, I I do, I encourage everyone across America to do it. This is not mine. You know, I, I started 936 Miles for Mercy, the campaign, but 
I don't need people to run things past me. Like we all have to become activists because if we want to save ours, we have to save all. So become the advocate, use this as leverage, use it as a springboard. It's just really time for us to like get so loud and stand up, stand up for these children. And the more people are talking about it, the more people are going to pay attention to it. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for having me on. And I appreciate you so much and the work that you're doing. It's really important. I know how heavy it is. And thank you for helping me to uh, shine a spotlight on um, helping protect our kids through the family court crisis. Time for one last word for my sponsors. Thank you so much to Sarah for speaking with me for today's episode about her cause. I'll include the link to her GoFundMe campaign and her Facebook event in the show notes for this episode. Please support her in any way you can. And if you live anywhere near Washington, D.C., I beg of you to please try to attend in person at any time throughout October 21st through 25th. I am going to try to be there for at least one of those days, if possible. That's it for this week. Join me next time for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com. You can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash stlcpod, where you can become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. You can also support the show at ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. Follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on TikTok at stlcpod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by DreamNote Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit ChildHelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something. <laughs>